<laughs> okay, so I think we're gonna start with our next uh, speaker. So Lisbeth is gonna, yeah, um, she's a researcher, coach and consultant with a background in law and moral philosophy. And she has international experience in Africa and Australia, I think, yes. And both in the private and the public sector, and I think she's very eager to also combine that experience with the more uh, with the academia side and research side of it, and trying to integrate that more. And she is also vocal. I heard about uh, what talks about the need for a sensible and sensitive leadership, and I'm actually kind of curious to hear, yeah, what you have to say about this. And yeah, welcome. Thank stage, you very much. <laughs> Dear all, good morning. I'm going to share with you my insights on the topic anti-corruption law as a fiction, the illusion of serving morality by controlling it through rules and regulations. Well, that's quite a mouthful. So <laughs> what my story boils down to is the analysis that in the Western world, over the past few hundred years, we've built a legal system that works for us. Uh, we have implemented it, and perhaps I could better say we have forced it onto societies that have existed for many, many thousand years, and even perhaps even hundreds of thousands of years, um, and that were very well connected to their environment, uh, forming stable ecosystems. And this imposition of Western frameworks had a very destructive effect uh, on these ecosystems and societies, stable societies, causing instability with all the problems and consequences we know about, like wars and etc. But before I'm going to share my thoughts with you, I take the opportunity to thank Jan Wouter Fassbinder and Paralimas for inviting me as a speaker at this conference. I'm very grateful that I may stand here and may talk about something that really touches my heart very deeply. Let us start. I'm going to take you on a journey. This place is covered with dense tropical forests. When we fly over it, here you see the shadow of the plane, it looks, it are all my own pictures, by the way, it looks like a field of broccoli. It has lovely valleys and pristine beaches. Imagine you're surrounded by this forest, filled with damp and hot air, and that you could hear the screeching sounds of parrots and monkeys. Deep in these forests, pygmies are still living peaceful and quiet life. In this forest, there are elephants, gorillas, snakes and crocodiles, and the local people in the villages in the neighborhoods sincerely believe that people turn into elephants at night and become humans again during the day. These local people so connected with nature believe that their ancestors are parrots or hippos. The ancestors are considered to be part of the moral community. For thousands of years, the same rituals still determine significant events in life. Village consists of houses made of wood, bamboo, and palm <laughs> leaves, and the jungle serves as a pharmacy. A plant is available for every health problem. So this is the country I'm talking about. Gabon, <clears throat> or officially La République Gabonaise. It's a previous French colony that became independent in 1960. It's about half the size of France, and France has about 67 million inhabitants, Gabon about two and a half million. So you can imagine how scarcely populated the area is, and it's largely covered with primary forest. And I was there. I lived in Gabon for exactly six years, from April 2005 to April 2011. And I went there together with my then husband who had an international assignment with Shell. We got the opportunity to go to Gabon as he was able to get a job at Shell Gabon. Shell Gabon was located, and I'm going to show that to you, 
right here. Um, I think that's here. So it's really in a certain part. It's really remote area. It's um, a, a, only 60 kilometers of thermic and the rest is just jungle. So I had just finished a master of applied ethics at Utrecht <coughs> University and was dedicated to conduct a PhD research. There was already there were already two professors, one from the philosophy department and one from the law department who were willing to be my supervisors. I agreed with my then husband on a stay to Gabon under the condition I could do PhD research in Gabon. So he brought me into contact with Franck Denel, a very nice Frenchman who then was the managing director of Shell Gabon. And um, in his previous job, Franck had revised, and it was just his previous job, so it uh, was quite recent for him. He revised the Shell general business principles in the London headquarters, and he was very dedicated to ethics. So he was very happy to find out that someone with an ethical background showed up amidst all those engineers that populated Shell Gabon. He asked me whether I would be willing to focus my research on a question that also for Shell um, would be relevant. And that was this question. He said to me, given that corruption is more common in many non-Western areas than in Western areas, can we overlook the possibility of a non-Western view of corruption? And if this perspective existed, what would it look like? Also, both my supervisors back in Utrecht University thought this could be an interesting question for a PhD research. Of course, the research had to be independent. I will come back to that later. The managing director of Shell Gabon brought me into contact with some people high in the Shell organization. So I visited these people in the headquarters in London and in The Hague, and in conversation with them, it was really clear that it, that there was broad support for this research. Shell wanted to know whether perhaps it had a blind spot with regards to its view on the business principles. And let's be honest, corruption is a very serious problem. <clears throat> and I'm not saying anything new, I hope here. So it undermines human development. It avoids, diverts public resources away from the provision of essential services. It increases inequality, hinders na national and mm -hmm. local economic development by distorting markets for goods and services. It corrodes the rule of law and it destroys public trusts in government and leaders. If you look at the corruption perception index of NGO Transparency International, <clears throat> it's annually produced, um, then we see that, that this actually indeed shows that cor corruption is far less perceived to happen in so-called Western <laughs> countries. And um, if we look at these darker colored areas, <coughs> very generally speaking, we refer to them as developing countries, transitional <laughs> countries, failed states, fragile states. And so looking at this map, this question of Shell seems to make sense. So what was this research project about? Um, so, and what did I do? Because to get some clue about what a possible non-Western perspective on corruption might be, <coughs> we agreed that I should start with an explorative anthropolo anthropological orientation with the aim to find out how people thought about values, about when actions would be acceptable, considered acceptable or not, <coughs> what values are core values to them personally. <coughs> and of course, I was very interested in the context in which values are mentioned by people. Where do values occur is to be playing a decisive role. The first one half year, I spoke with many people of all walks of life, with different backgrounds, predominantly local people, but also people from other African countries. I spoke with people working for different companies, 
uh, staff, contractors, cleaners, taxi drivers, farmers, shop owners, elders, mothers, fathers, children, teachers, advisors of the president, local politicians, students, the archbishop, and also professors of Université Omabongo in Libreville, the capital of Gabon. I'm still very grateful to all these people, the cooperation and their willingness to share their values and their stories with me, providing me a glimpse of how they perceive the world. The conversations <clears throat> helped me a lot in gaining insight that were relevant also for my qualitative theoretical part of my research. Research has to be conducted independently. So Shell had no involvement or influence in all that I would write. Moreover, the arrangements with Shell consisted of a confidentiality agreement in which I also promised that I would neither write about Shell nor about Gabon. <clears throat> the research question had to be dealt with in a more general way, but also in a way that provided a proper and satisfactory answer. Shell facilitated um, my research by helping me out, sorry, by helping me out with practical matters, as I was very remote from my university and very remote from ex actually everything. On a part-time basis, I worked as an ethics and compliance officer for Shell Gabon, and I developed and facilitated workshops for employees and contractors on dealing with dilemmas, uh, dealing with conflict of interest, on cultural diversity, <laughs> and I was actually also actively involved in rolling out the first code of conduct in 2008 of Shell um, and doing code of conduct inductions with new employees. And that's always on a one-to-one -one basis. This was very great to do, and it helped me a lot with my research too. After one and a half years, I began to get a little bit of a picture on the basis of my anthropological preliminary orientation. So what was this about? <clears throat> Although people may have different cultural backgrounds, there are not so many differences in what people value the most. Actually, the answers I got were really quite consistent. We all value honesty, trust and trustworthiness, responsiveness, also reciprocity, integrity, justice, respect for human dignity. So these were values I distilled from the conversations. And you can wonder, okay, when we all value this, these values, how come that the world looks so differently, different places in the world? I'll come back, back to that later. So what about the stories that were shared with me? I'll share you one story of a guy, let's call him Ze, that's a typical Bantu name, who told me the following. Actually, it was very representative for many other reactions too. Ze told me, I feel lost being torn apart between the Western system of my work, on my work, mm -hmm. and the local framework of the family, and they, they don't understand each other. It tears us apart as a community and as individuals. It's schizophrenic and I feel lonely and alienated. I sometimes don't know what is the right thing to do anymore. I sometimes fear losing myself and my health suffers. And then he continued and said, and you don't know what that is like. You cannot imagine how I feel. That was of course a very confrontational response. And I can tell you, he was not the only one. <coughs> As a Westerner, you think that the whole world is organized according to the same, namely Western view. But no way this is the case. Often in these conversations, I felt the ground moving and shifting away under my feet. Because all of these conversations, and I actually never stopped after this one and a half <coughs> first year, I continued during my whole stay of six years was in Gabon. They enriched my life enormously. And all the time it made me feel more humble and humble that the Western outlook on society is definitely not the only one and not the only justifiable one. 
What was Nzeli referring to? Finding this out was part of the theoretical part of my research. The Western system of Nzeli's work environment involved the setup of the business environment of Western societies, in which the legal contract is the basis. And now it becomes a little bit theoretical. I hope um, I, will, I will keep you with me in this story. The contract we have in Western societies is task specific. One has a contract about delivering a task of work and about showing commitment to this professional task. But for the rest, one has one's own private life. The framework of the traditional life of Nj's family, by contrast, involves a so-called status bond. This is a term distinguished by legal scholar Henry Main. He did research on ancient forms of agreement, arrangement. And this status bond is a family bond involving all aspects of life. It's a, transform it's a transformative act of cosmological importance. And then I refer also to what Helga yesterday shared with us. Um, in traditional societies, things we do always are integrated in a cosmological um, um, whole, a, a cosmological universe. Well, that's a little bit double, but you, you understand what I mean. So everything is related to your identity, who you are, but also how your environment is and everything in your environment. Um, I um, would like to refer also on Ab Adam Zeligman, a sociologist, who assumes that the so-called conditioned and inter-institutional space in societies or preconditional uh, space is part of the modern type of contract. So in other words, we have a freedom to take this contract or that contract when you don't like it anymore, you just say, okay, uh, good friends, but I'm going to do something else. In this traditional framework they was part of, that is not possible. And that's a very fundamental difference. <coughs> so um, in, the, in the Western world, we have a distinction between the social role and the occupant of that role. That doesn't exist in the traditional status bond. This, this space is also the space trust plays a role and can occur. In Jay's outlook on life, in his world, everything is conditioned, being part of the bond. There's no actual choice and therefore there actually is no room for trust because everything is conditioned. Well, let's continue now. The re <coughs> reaction of today and many others remind me of another story, namely the novel, No Longer at Ease, perhaps you know that, of Chinua Chibi, Nigerian author who wrote a trilogy and No Longer at Ease in 1960 is the middle one of the books. No Longer at Ease takes place in Nigeria, just before its independence in 1960. It's about a young Nigerian guy named Obi, who returns home to Lagos after having studied in England. Because Obi was so smart, the extended family collected the financial means for his studies abroad. Now Obi came back home. It was his turn to pay back. He started working for the British government and behaved more British than the British first refusing the requests of his family. But when time went on, the discrepancy between the traditional life of the Ibo group, Ibo group, his family was part of, on the one hand, and the British outlook on society of the government and labels, <coughs> on the other hand, became an ever widening gap and increasingly challenged Obi until he finally succumbs and falls in this gap. And that happens when he accepts a bribe. Due to the loss of moral compass, he can no longer bridge the differences. 
both paradigms seem to exclude each other. A very tragic story. We see the problem of Western domination. <coughs> um, uh, we see that the problem Western domination had caused. Um, and we also see under a magnifying glass what corruption can look like and how it uh, can be induced. <clears throat> it's about being squared between the old ecosystem of traditional life and the Western legal system. And people can be torn apart between these systems. The stories of Obi and Zay and the similar stories of other people I spoke with made me realize that Achieve's novel lost none of his topicality. Although it was about 50 years later, Achibi already put it on the agenda and it is still very relevant. It occurred to me that given the non-Western perspective on corruption I was looking for in my research, it would not only be interesting, but very vital to look from this first person perspective and look, look at this subjective angle, individual angle, to how corruption actually could work. Um, and also to show, it, it would be it would enable me to show the, the potentially tragic consequences of colliding paradigms. For that reason, I thought Still Not at Ease would be an appropriate title of my PhD thesis, which I defended in 2015 at Utrecht University. I already mentioned to you that I agreed with Shell Gabon to write neither about Shell nor about Gabon. At the same time, I aimed to find a tangible and practical context to position these individual <coughs> dramas I'm talking about with these uh, stories of Nzei and Obi. So I choose for the Democratic Republic of Congo as a case study. And on this previous world map of the Corruption Perception Index of Transparency International, we saw already that the Democratic Republic of Congo, I can show that to you again, is a very colored space. So it, it makes sense to locate a case study right there. <clears throat> Given this map of Transparency International, um, <laughs> you can imagine that the DSC is even a better example than Kabul, as it is more extreme. On the basis of the insight of the anthropological fieldwork, I wrote fictive scenarios demonstrating possible collisions of the two involved paradigms I previously presented. And I did that from a first person perspective. Let's just look a bit closer at the Democratic Republic of Congo. So looking at it at first glance, then you think, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, government buildings. They both have flags. This is in Brussels. Uh, Bel it, was a, it was a colony of Belgium. Um, that's the Belgian flag in Brussels. This is the Congolese flag in Kinshasa. Um, <laughs> Shops in the street look quite similar. So in a first glance, you think, hmm, OK, um, the Belgians did a good job. I'm a bit cynical now. Um, <laughs> as, as the institutional setup looks quite similar. But nothing is what it likes. Would you believe this? There is a global integrity report of 2006. I was looking for a more recent report. Actually, I couldn't find it, and I don't think it's there on, on Congo. Um, global integrity looks is, is investigating, or uh, do you say that doing research into uh, um, how the legal framework to combat mm -hmm. corruption is organized? It's looking at the quality of the laws. And um, it's very interesting that it concluded. So it, it, it rates all the uh, legal frameworks about uh, combating corruption, this, this anti-corruption law. And it's, you get tears in your, in your eyes, because when you look at the score of the Democratic Republic, 
and I really studied this all very well. Um, it got a hundred percent score. So it was, you couldn't score better on your anti-corruption framework than Kondo did. That's fantastic. And especially against the backdrop of the 75% of the score Australia had. So Australia really had some homework to do still to improve its legal framework on anti-corruption. It's really, really fun. It's the world upside down. Because if you look at reality, the story is completely different because we all know, given the Corruption Perception Index of Transparency International, that of course, in reality, the Democratic Republic of Congo is perceived as far more perhaps than Australia. So what is going on here? I already mentioned that we often refer to non-Western countries as the DRC as develop in terms of developing fragile or failed states. <coughs> Let's be honest, these are not morally neutral adjectives. They express a Western perspective. That doesn't help very much if you look for a non-Western perspective on corruption or on values. So what, what should I do? You can imagine that I was very happy that I came across a term I, I wasn't familiar with at all, and I don't know whether you know it, the term hybrid political order. Is someone here familiar with this term? It's a large minority. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's coined this term by Volker Beugen, sociologist working in, um, in Melanesia, uh, Oceania. I've met him when I lived in Brisbane, very nice guy. And I was very grateful that he came up with, and together with others, he did research on this. And he coined this hybrid political order. And it's a very neut morally neutral, descriptive <clears throat> way of, of framing what is going on in countries like the DRC. So what is it about? It is explicitly an order. It's not a nation state. Why? Because the nation state is very severely debated. There are always militia in these kind of areas that say, no, no, we are the country, or this part doesn't belong to us, or doesn't belong to these people, it belongs to us. So the state is formally given, but it's not a daily lived reality. And there is a very strong tension, it's part of how it works, between the formal or the legal uh, a setup and the informal actual organization. So there is no clear delineation between the public and the private sphere. It's negotiated in a continuous dynamic. This means that there is no stability. There is no actual legal certainty. Everything has to be found out in daily life. How, how institutions relate to each other, how people have to relate to each other, um, which, which doesn't give a, a feeling of, of security and safety and um, also reliability. As you don't know, you, institutions are not trustworthy. So I think this is a very interesting term because if you it's a term but if you look at it from a conceptual point of view you could say yeah this is actually ex the, the problem that they yeah. and obi faced that what is the problem in on a, on a level uh, a macro sorry i did something uh on a macro level is also a problem in a, on a micro level of personal life so that, I thought this is an avenue to go. That would be offer me something interesting on this, on this uh, quest for uh, looking at a non-Western perspective. Um, and, and also you can see quite well in this concept that uh, there is a close relationship between how we conceive society and its citizens and the interaction between the two. In the following sheet, I will explain the theoretical background of the legal framework of the West 
Western countries. Um, mm. And that was set up in order to deal with corruption effectively in its own societies. I hope it's 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 a bit a bit theoretical. I hope, uh, but you can please ask me if you if something is unclear. I had to make for my qualitative theoretical part of my research. I had to come up with a hypothesis, of course. So um, we the given fact is. The starting point is corruption is more common in non-Western countries than in Western countries. The general assumption is that um, these countries are not sufficiently, these non-Western countries do not sufficiently comply with anti-corruption laws and regulations because people are not willing to comply with these law in these, in these countries or they are of ill will. Um, but they, they should behave like we expect them to do, and it's their fault that they don't do that. I think, given the story of Nje and all other people I spoke with that confirmed that, that we can come up with an alternative um, view on this matter. Um, <clears throat> you can also reason that the imposed anti-corruption laws and regulations presume a paradigm that does not reflect the lived and experienced morality. So you can, like Zay and Obi, say, hey, what's going on here? There is non-compliance because these people lose their moral compass. <coughs> it's us that impose our moral compass on them, and then we blame them for losing their moral compass. <coughs> Adjectives as developing fragile and failed express the dominant view of corruption. Corruption in non-Western countries is very prevalent because the state fails. That's the reason. People don't comply with the rules and the lack of effectiveness, as I said, can be explained by ill will. On an institutional level, you can say, yeah, institutions are weak. Um, but in the end, institutions are embodied by people. I don't, I don't exclude the possibility that the first assumption still might be true. But I think on top of that, there is this other avenue we should explore. The imposed anti-corruption laws and regulations presume a paradigm that does not reflect the lived and experienced reality. Non-compliance because of loss of moral compass is a big problem. But Perhaps the Western solution that we tried by implementing and forcing on anti-corruption also is part of the cause of the problem. So if you look at anti-corruption law, then we can distinguish two important acts, the so-called Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in 1977 and um, the UK Bribery Act of 2010. I will not get into it in detail, but both these acts have uh, via companies that are registered in for the US or in the UK um, uh, and, and companies that are uh, located in, in countries, for instance, as, as Congo, um, can uh, may affect uh, local people if they are also so it affects uh, uh, employees but also contractors also of local origin so that means um that and and then given the fact that with the uk bribery act there's an interesting shift because the fcpa looks at corrupt intent but the 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 uk bribery act looks at appearance of conduct. It's a strict liability approach. I think there are a few lawyers here who, who know it, but it looks at, at behavior. And, and um, due to this, uh, this development of strict liability approach, which we see in many anti-corruption laws, we get a shift from looking at corruption to actually judging conflict of interest, mm -hmm. appearance of conflict of interest. So it means that it's not only about corruption, which is the essence of corruption is bribery, which I come back into later on, uh, but also integrity breaches as such. 
that's a far more wider scope. Um, let us look at the basics. Don't we all want to live in a society where there is peace and where we can trust each other? Ideally, we would like to live in a stable, safe place where we get respect and are treated in a just and honest way and where is, there is room to flourish. This ideal requires predictable <clears throat> and trustworthy institutions. The pristine setting of the previously pictured jungle has been stable for thousands of years. The pictures I portrayed in, of Gabon in first sight when I started my talk with beautiful beasts and forest, beaches and forests reminds us of the typical holiday advertisement pictures of a paradise to escape the world of our daily life. See the right hand picture. The tradition on ideas for ideal societies, ideal worlds is already pretty old. Think of, for instance, Plato's Republic. The presentation of ideal words go often hand in hand with criticizing one's existing society. An early 16th century example is Thomas More's idea of, the, um, of utopia. And we see that on the left hand side. If you look at, at the history of current Western societies, we show a few developments that more or less coincided and formed together <coughs> the basis of the modern rule of law-based nation state. It works for us, but it doesn't imply that it works for others. In the coming sheets, I will be digging a dig, dig deeper in the background of this Western legal system, and it provides us an insight in where it may have gone wrong. Utrecht University-based economic historian Bas van Bavel wrote a book how market economies have emerged and declined since Anno Domine 500. It's published in 2016. In this book, he analyzes five examples of free market economies in history. In their flourishing phase, free market economies <coughs> coincide with the prevalence in society of independent judiciary equality and also the protection of certain rights. Actually, if we look at our own development in Western societies uh, the last few hundred years, we see a similar development. Paul Larcy yesterday showed us a painting about the peace of Westphalia, uh, the swearing of the oath of the ratification of the Treaty of Münster in 1648, a painting by Gerard Terborg. That is kind of the moment nation states were born in Western Europe. Um, and it coincided with the development of the rule of law uh, based on this growing enlightenment ideal <clears throat> that human dignity was project worthy. Human beings have inalienable rights that are considered worthy of respect. Corruption is a very serious threat to such a society. So what we, did we do? We outsourced vital task of society to the state and we created a public domain for that. So by establishing a state where the law is the highest authority, we created a public sphere. And so military defense, independent and impartial judiciary taxation, et cetera, became part of the public domain where public tasks. The rationale was to prevent corruption to happen and protect human dignity. Dignity. And actually, if you look at the core of the corruption concept, it's actually bribery of public office. So I come back to that later. <laughs> actually, the protection of human dignity, when you put it in an enlightenment um, uh, uh, context, and then I refer to Helga's uh, talk yesterday, actually, it's about the protection of moral agency. When we talk about respect for human dignity, we talk about respect for moral agency. The law is the highest authority. You're talking about a sovereign nation state. There is a, with the creation of the state, which of course, yeah, we, we can't literally say this, but this is a reconstruction. There is a distinction, a fundamental distinction, a watershed between the public and the private domain. 
the public tasks and actually the rational for these tasks is to protect the private domain. There's a focus on legal basis for institutions and a legal protection of human rights. Actually, with the creation of this distinction between public and private domain, <coughs> there is a clear hierarchy between types of institutions. The sociologist Mark, Max Weber distinguishes in his economy and society between three types of authority, which also is uh, positioned um, uh, against the backdrop of historical development. And they go, in my words, uh, hand in hand with the growing complexity of society. So first he distinguishes so-called traditional authority. It's a type of authority um, dominated by kinship relationship. And, and you can um, boils down to this idea of status bond of main, which I uh, already mentioned. The second um, is the charismatic type of authority, and that already fits with a far more stratified and even more complex society. And the third type, which is fundamentally different than the earlier two, is the so-called legal authority. Um, it's fundamentally different because not, it's not a person with the highest authority, it's the law. And um, and it came uh, it, it it became a, a, a way of organizing our uh, society as a as a response. Um, uh, no, well, as it, it's based on the need uh, to, to to really protect the stability of society. So it didn't work anymore to have persons um, in a position of power. It was a danger. It was this be very destabilizing. So uh, we needed another trick to survive. And, um, um, and this legal type of authority was developed over the last 350 years. Person-based forms of authority are really sensitive to corruption and legal authority is the answer to that. It had to protect society from corruption. The legal basis of institutions, impartial judiciary, and protection of human rights can, can, can so be seen as instruments for preventing corruption to happen. The creation of the law-based nation state also implies the creation of a hierarchy, as I said already, between the public and the private sphere. And the role of the public domain, I said it already, is to protect the private domain. It's only possible if the private domain doesn't interfere with the public domain. Let us look at that from a conceptual point of view. The rationale of the rule of law is protecting human dignity against corruption. I said it already. And if we see that corruption is the primary of public office, pri prioritizing one's private interest at the expense of the public interest, then we could say that this corruption concept presupposes the whole idea of the rule of law. That is a watershed which is really characteristic for uh, and a feature of the rule of law. Let's not forget that the protection of human dignity was a driver for the legal authority um, and also for the creation of this type of states. For that reason, it involved the development of, of bureaucracy, implying a formal, namely legal distance between the social and professional role on the one hand and the one who occupies that role on the other hand. So there is a conceptual <clears throat> distinction between the social role and the one who occupies, occupies that role. Um, and, and Weber said, Vital for public office is that it is conducted sine era et studio, which means without hatred and passion. So we have to detach from our personal interest in order to occupy <coughs> a public role in an appropriate way. And um, and it was just to protect it against corruption, exploitation. So there is something else which is relevant in this uh, respect. Um, with this distinction between 
the social role and the one who occupies the role, which is with the status bond in traditional society, not at all the case. Um, then you could say this, this is discretionary space. It's, it's space for making decisions. It's this unconditional sphere of Seligman. And actually this is the space which gives us room to act is actually also the space where corruption could happen. It's namely the space to create fiction, to make believe what one is doing is the right thing to do, but in fact, one is undermining it. And if I said it already, um, if we look at traditional society, society before the interference of Western societies, um, there was no pro formal public private distinction. There were far less social roles because these were small societies. And for that reason, there was less or less discretionary space. I made a conceptual analysis for cor of corruption, and it's precisely this space where we can create a fiction. And that's important to be aware of that because when we look now at what actually happens is that we produce a very intriguing loop. The corruption concept, if you look at the score, bribery of public office, presupposes the rule of law. The discretionary space which came to existence by this distinction, by creating this public this distinction between the public and private domain is also uh, a prerequisite for corruption to occur. This, um, this actually remains completely uh, implicit in anti-corruption law. Um, so what happens, we export it and, and we forced it on other countries, we, we exported this rule of law concept with the anti-corruption legislation to societies um, to which it originally did not apply. And we said, oh yeah, you don't have a rule of law. And we, we looked at the institutions and said, oh guys, it's wrong what you are doing. Uh, you must be very corrupt, but and we are going to civilize you. But in fact, it is, it's, it's a little bit funny because um, in fact, we were more corrupt, most probably, than these societies because they were very stable for a long time. And also, we we're introducing a concept that didn't apply to them. Our concept of corruption did not apply to them. And also in practice, it was not so very easy to be corrupt because there was no space to create a fiction. And there is always space to create fiction. It's part of the human condition to, to bend things to your own interest. <laughs> So I'm not, not uh, talking about the noble savages here. Um, it's just practical reasoning. Um, I have to add something because um, I'm talking about public offices, um, but given the fact that free market economy, the free market economy and the uh, uh, distinction between public and private uh, sphere, that's the creation uh, in hindsight, reconstruction again of, of the legal, uh, of the rule of law, kind of coincided, um, and, and also for uh, mm -hmm. the institutions in the private domain, for instance, uh, companies and, and NGOs, there is a legal basis for, for, um, for these institutions, so they're bound to the rule of law as well. So even for private office counts this same discretionary space and this idea of legal contract. So even there, there is room to distort and to bend um, things to your own interest and undermine your office, your, your role, your professional role. <coughs> so um, if we look at this combination of, of uh, I'm, I'm talking about a uh, rule of law based nation state, so that's a kind of state model. But if you look at, at it from a societal point of view, you could say, yeah, it's an open society. It's, it's a society, it's open, it's resilient, and it's because of this unconditional sphere. You can make choices. There is freedom to say, okay, yeah, I'm going to do something else. Um, 
With exporting the rule of law, we exported this institutional setup and therefore um, also the modern base of contract. <coughs> and actually we thought we could control corruption to arranging a legal framework there. And I said already, it's a cynical truth that it didn't apply. Um, this results in a very weird situation because although the rationale of legal authority, the rule of law, is to protect human dignity, it ended up or it ends up in fact harming human dignity and even undermining human dignity because these hybrid political orders lack legitimacy. And by, by the fact that Jay and Obi are ruled by laws by which they feel alienated, it harms their human dignity. So actually, the problem, the, the, the solution we introduced there as an answer to corruption actually caused a problem. We caused, we caused the people felt um, not respected. And that could be an incentive to, to become corrupt. And now, yeah, I'm, I'm saying hybrid political orders lack legitimacy. So what is that about? If you, if you look at this image, it's actually a very funny picture because what did we do? We introduced an institutional setup very literally. This is a Kenyan court and it's about 30 degrees there. What did they do? They were behaving like British courts and wearing perukes. Uh, most probably there is an air conditioning <laughs> in that room because otherwise it will be far too hot. And we said, yeah, this is how you do independent, independent and impartial judiciary. But for thousands of years, this, the, the rule of law is only three, 350 years old, kind of, and, and we implemented that. But these people had already for thousands of years a very stable system of checks and balances, <laughs> which actually had very similar <laughs> principles. Yeah, I'm referring back to this anthropological finding of the, that people all over the world value kind of the same values as vital for society and for well-being. So it's the world upside down. And let's be honest, this is a Germanic uh, thing, thing. So it's where law was um, performed. It's, it's also a political, political area. It's, we, we, thousands of years, we had similar systems and they worked. So um, let us not forget that also in our own areas in the West, we, we had reasons to change perhaps, but also we had very robust uh, ecosystems with their own checks and balances. So let us let me go back to this um, universal values I distinguished in my anthropological uh, orientation. So we could say, I, I came to the insight that we can indeed, but it stands from a normative reasoning because first I analyzed everything and then I came up with a normative idea of how we could do it. And, and you could in this indeed say, yes, um, the way we deal with it from a legal perspective, from the legal perspective, corruption, the core of corruption concept is bribery of public office. But in fact, and that's the development we see also in anti-corruption law, um, we can look at also from a broader perspective and say, yeah, um, it's actually the abuse of a fiduciary duty. And that is a kind of a universal way of looking at it because we all have responsibilities. And even when you are a parent, whether you're in the African jungle or in China or um, in the Netherlands or in Sweden, uh, there are certain things that are universal that you think, yeah, you, you never should do that as a parent to your kid. So, um, so actually you could see that these values are constitutive for society as such. Society could not exist without having trustworthy institutions. What is the basis for that? The idea of a fiduciary duty. The idea, yeah, I'm referring now to King Charles, who's, who said, I'm here to serve. That is the fiduciary idea that you are serving 
um, the trans and living up to the trustworthiness of an institution. And, and corruption undermines trustworthiness. It undermines also um, the idea that I, when I come here, I may expect that the university behaves as I expect the university should behave, or at the general, the general assumptions of how a university should function. And, um, and so corruption <laughs> in fact undermines society as such. And, um, and, and what we do is um, that, we, that we look, um, we imported, we, we were moral relativist in, in the way that <laughs> in, uh, exported our and, and, and enforced an institutional setup and actually, that's more relativism. What I what I um, propose as a, as an alternative is uh, moral universalism, but then context in a context sensitive way. So you have to, it's it's based on an institutional translation. So we have to look at the essence and not at the form, and that's what we where we go wrong. And we we attach to a form and say, yeah, yeah, you have to wear perukes if you really would like to be a good judge. You have to work where Baruch, but that's not what what the essence of of good judiciary is. To be an independent judge is how you deal with things and practice whatever you look like. So, um, so we could say, what is the problem of the law in hyper political orders? It is that it is, is not, um, it, it doesn't apply to the institutional, the formal laws do not, and, and, and anti-corruption law with an international impact, they do not um, relate uh, to, to the outlook on society of, of the local people. It's, it's really going over their head. It doesn't, it doesn't resonate with them. So, um, We can say, yeah, they are not sufficiently effective. Um, and we can also say, yeah, they don't reflect the moral convictions of daily life. And um, and and actually, it it's makes very sense. And if you think uh, logically, you think, OK, yeah, but that makes this it's, it's normal that laws have to be legitimate. And the, the important uh, Montesquieu uh, already said in the spirit of the laws, if you would like laws to be effective, then people that are governed by laws should recognize themselves in, in these laws. Otherwise, it's never going to work. And, um, and, it, and, and laws should make sense in the sense that they're reasonable. And I should consider a law reasonable and, and really fitting for my purpose and for who I am, that I can say, yeah, yeah, this is a good law. And people like Zee and Albi wouldn't say that for anti-corruption law because it is a completely different institutional setting. Well, I think the point is clear. And actually, so it's, Montesquieu said this in 1748, and then there was still a lot of colonization taking place. Um, and, um, and, it, it, there, it was completely overlooked, <coughs> this whole point of legitimacy, and perhaps also intentionally. It had contract, uh, had tragic consequences. Let us um, look at a hybrid political order. How can we ensure that institutions and people comply with the law? As I said already, <coughs> um, we think you don't comply because you're stupid or you're ill-willed. So what do we do? We introduce more laws. So there's a whole bunch and a whole body of a lot of compliance <laughs> going on, also in the in the Western world itself. Uh, we are no saints whatsoever. And uh, so the answer to rules that are not effective is introducing even more rules, whereas the starting point is already wrong. If, if we would not consider them the legitimate, then it doesn't work. So um, the crucial question is, is it ineffective, the law, because people and institutions are unable to comply with it? Or is it because we 
who don't consider this laws legitimate. So actually, I think this story is very clear. I hope it's clear that my hypothesis I could confirm. I think, okay, you have this general assumption um, that the, um, this, this, this general idea of, yeah, these are failed states and people are ill-willed. So we have to introduce even more laws. But I think, and I did uh, a lot of work on that, and it resulted, it's a very big book, um, that's, that these anti-corruption laws resume a paradigm that is not legitimate and um, in these areas, non-Western areas, and that non-compliance easily could be explained by potential loss of moral compass. So what is this all about and why am I talking so long about it? Well, combating corruption and preventing corruption is crucial. It's already uh, said yesterday and the term has mentioned already a few times, I think, we are at this moment finding ourselves in a poly crisis. Pandemic, droughts, floods, mega storms and wildfires, threats of a third world war, how rapidly <coughs> have become inured to a list of shocks. So much that from time to time it's worth standing back to consider the sheer strangeness of our situation. This is Adam Toos, who said this in uh, Financial Times in 2002. And we're not sufficiently aware how big the role of corruption is in causing these poly crises. So um, we try to control parts of the world with our own laws. What the aim of control leads to is very well <clears throat> framed by sociologist, German sociologist Harmut Rosa, that the drive and desire towards controllability <laughs> ultimately creates monstrous, frightening forms of uncontrollability. And later in the book, he said, uncontrollability generated by processes intended to make the world controllable produces a radical alienation. Well, that's what they experienced. So the whole compliance industry is a way to control, to have control. And if we take into account that how do legal constructions <coughs> develop over time, then we see, well, Andrew Chen was already mm -hmm. at breakfast saying something about the, <laughs> the horrible role of, of bureaucracy. Um, and, and actually we're in a, a moment of time now that we, don't know what's up and down anymore. We got lost in the rules, which have a destructive effect because of bureaucratization. It's a snake that bites in its own tail. It does lose touch with reality and becomes a very destructive force. And actually, these rules become a form of derailment themselves. It's corruption what's going on. Just to a few examples, we have a few scandals in the Netherlands at the moment. The benefit scandal, it's about, actually it was a setup to, to support people uh, uh, with, with extra financial needs uh, when you have to take care of their kids. And due to bureaucratization, it went completely out of hand. And all the time the government said, yeah, no, of course, we are going to compensate you. And there were all kinds of plans, but because of other rules, we completely got lost talking about jungles um, in the jungle. And up till now, it's gone on already for quite a while, there is still no solution. And we, we can't solve it. It seems that we can't solve it anymore. It's, it's a very good example of how we get, get lost in bureaucracy and, and end up harming human dignity and therefore moral agency. Mm -hmm. And we learned from Helga yesterday how important moral ag agency is. <laughs> for envisioning futures. So if we look at it from an angle of ecosystems, the Union of International Associations, which is um, established in 1907 by Henri Lafontaine and Paul Otlet. Lafontaine was a Nobel laureate at 1913, and he was so one of the two founders. Um, this, this, this organization, 
informs other organizations um, and are informed by in relation to uh, the SDGs. So um, many of many organizations are related to the Union of International Associations. Um, an important figure in this organization is, uh, it's, it's located in Brussels, by the way, is Anthony Judge. And he <coughs> came with an insight that values, and I showed you these values, uh, I, I consider constitutive for society as such. Human values are an ecosystem. And against the backdrop of the quotations of Harmut Rosa, we see that weaker ecosystems become uh, that how weaker ecosystems become, the more control they try to exercise. <clears throat> and actually, I believe this is the ultimate illusion of control. Um, Peter Robertson is doing research on this and we work on this together, which is fantastic. But this is what we did. Our system with 300 years of rule of law is far more weaker than these villages that existed for thousands of years in uh, African countries and also other countries in the world that we colonized. And we said, hey, you're doing it wrong. You have to do the same as we do. But in fact, we were a very destructive force and we still are. So what do we learn from this whole exercise? I mentioned it already to you. I promote context moral universalism. Distinguish between the institutional form and type of institutional essence and do not confuse the two. And that's what we did. Confusion is a form of moral relativism. This is what we do when we impose our Western system on others with different systems of their own, different ecosystems. Context sensitive moral universe, context sensitive universalism is what I propose. And awareness of ecosystem complexity. Strong but simpler ecosystems deserve respect. We can learn from them. And you see this now in the whole development focus on indigenous societies. I think it's a very good, very good development. And we should help them to maintain themselves mm -hmm. before the Amazon forests and other areas just disappear. And then we end up, oh, oh yeah, oh, how do we survive in this world? Uh, and we have no clue because we, we destructed everything we could have learned from. Fixing is a way of controlling it. We should not try to fix things. Deal with it, don't <laughs> fix it. The solution caused the problem it intended to solve. The crisis I'm talking about is a crisis of legal control. The illusion of control can create disastrous frictions and fictions. So if it ain't broken, don't fix it. The way Western interventions had and still have disastrous and destructive effects in, for instance, HPOs, private political orders, only could be seen as the work of a sorcerer's apprentice in the very early stage of his training. And I don't know whether you're familiar with the film movie Fantasia of Walt Disney and the beautiful music of Duca. Um, this is actually what we do. We think in charge, we're in charge and we can do everything with our magic. But in fact, we are in the destructive force. It's our hoopers. And let's not forget, and I mentioned this benefit scandal in the Netherlands. <coughs> we are going wrong in the Western world as well at the moment. We see corruption uh, increasing in Western societies now as well. And I see that as uh, this is the, the consequence of not focusing on the right things. We're focusing on the form, not on the essence. And that's what we should do. Claiming to be in charge while having no actual clue what you're doing is very destructive. And it's also very dangerous. But this, that mean that, um, that we have to live in a disenchanted world with no magic at all. Helga already stretches the importance of magic and I fully agree with her because we need the power of imagination. It's 
what keeps our societies open and makes us resilient. To stay out of the illusion of control, you need good magic. You have the black magic also in Africa, you have black magic and white magic. And I think without knowing it, we are, have, had, have handed up in black magic, but we need white magic. And we should not forget that the white magic happens outside of our comfort zone. And that's exactly the way to stay out of this illusion of control. So that's what I would like to conclude with. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this extremely fascinating talk. Uh, it was a real tour de force. Um, there are several things I feel like uh, just repeating or noting. I really like this uh, idea that we can, uh, there are some underlying uh, universal moral values, right? And, uh, yeah, with respect to um, like how still, uh, and, and this has been for me personally as well, I would say more of a recent journey that I, I understand like how Western norms or modern norms are, are being um, imposed all over the world yeah. and, and the destructive effects of it. Uh, and I, I, I'm afraid I'm not going to say anything new uh, when I mention, for example, if you look at indigenous communities all over the world because of the loss of the moral compass, it's, it's really strange. We see alcoholism everywhere, whether it is yeah. in your communities or, you know, people um, who are close, living closer to my hometown. Uh, Crystal meth also. Sorry? Yeah. Crystal meth. There's a lot of yeah. drugs abuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And, and uh, again, we as researchers maybe can be also much more careful about how we are using terms uh, like developing, uh, developed, uh, low income, high income. I, I, I prefer where possible to use terms like high consumption, low consumption. I think what we need to start um, problematizing. And uh, yeah, but with respect to uh, comment or a question and, and definitely this uh, illusion of, of um, uh, eradicating uh, or, or I would say rather that it's uh, neo-colonialism and colonialism that has been uh, perpetuating corruption also ecologically, if, if we look at that aspect. And, and as you mentioned, uh, this is crumbling, right? Uh, this, this paradigm framework is crumbling even in the Western societies. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering if, what, what can be some framework for synthesizing this or, or is this fundamentally or, or uh, and we talk about learning from more indigenous ways of doing things, but then I'm wondering if it is also a bit incompatible with modernity, you know, with social complexities. And and yeah. because I, I also, you know, on it's really strange because I, I very much cherish these values as well, where we try to, uh, you know, be above or really separate public and private. So it's... it's yeah, actually, the, the work of Malinowski, who did research, uh, he's an anthropologist, uh, and, and he uh, did research on the Tobriand Islands. And it's quite fascinating what he what he finds. And and um, I use it also in my research, I think it's very vital <laughs> that in every type of society, we can distinguish a kind of public and private sphere. And even if there is no formal distinction in terms of a, of a legal state and there's legal authority. Even if that's absent in, I mentioned that already, but in, all over the world, there are parents and their children and we have universal ideas of, um, of what good parenting should be or what a good leader should be. Um, and, and these are very important things because also in these very small communities, there is a chef who, who when his son has done something really bad to someone else in the, in the group, said, oh, um, in French they say, je suis touché, I'm affected. I'm not capable of judging in this case. I, I can't be impartial because it's about my son. And they ask others, to, um, to, to assess the situation. This happens all over the world. The idea that you're too affected because of a, of a close relationship is really an awareness that is there. And the idea that you have a social role which comes with certain resp responsibilities is, is based on this idea that apart from um, how I perceive myself, if I'm, um, if I'm, well, hunting or, or preparing the meal, 
if I talk with my kids, I'm in a different I'm in a different role. So there are, and, and it's interesting in, in Bantu languages, there's a lot of proverbs about all these social roles and how you should behave in certain situations. <laughs> and actually that's only possible because we have ideas and there is a distinction between a social role and how you who you are in as a private person. And it's very um, related to certain contexts, certain practices. So I think there is a clue for this universalism. And, and I, th I think I, I, what I see myself having done in this research is a kind of institutional, um, uh, institutional reframing and institutional um, yeah, innovation of looking differently at what the basis of institutions is. And universally, I think it is the fiduciary duty, the idea that you have to serve the role and and um that counts for everything you have to live up to what is a good what should a good father that's the question what should a good father do in this role what should a good chef do in this role what should a good driver do in this role ideally what is the ideal type of driver in this situation and i think there are the clues and then there is this other thing on a larger scale um how, for instance, what is the way forward in hybrid political orders? You can enforce in making better states, better legal institutions, but it's also very interesting to look what is happening from a bottom-up perspective. What's happening in Kibera, that is um, the largest slums in Nairobi, in Kenya, is that you see that it looks all like chaos, but the, what, ha what actually happens there, that there are private uh, uh, initiatives that there is a mother who is a kid that needs a school and he said hey there, there are no good schools okay i'm going to i'm going to set up a school <laughs> together with a few other people she arranges school and it functions really well there is a group of maasai said well we have to guard security here because it's a very unsafe place so so you bottom up <clears throat> there is a development of of those roles uh, education security and safety um, their, their health initiative um, churches step into things especially when there is no strong uh, functioning state then there is room for for private initiatives and it, it may be a bottom-up development of uh, of, of a rule of law kind of situation in which this uh, unconditioned sphere uh, Zeeland is talking about can exist, can come to into existence. Whether it will be stable, we mm -hmm. have to see. But it's it's in a direction which I think is very positive. And um, and and if you look at this this distance to this non-functioning uh, uh, state, it might very well be if if these initiatives stabilize <coughs> that there are some, some moments <coughs> find a new equilibrium and um and so you actually referring to nick it's it's our forms of self-organization and actually that's what we aim for as a as a, a aspiration also for for new leadership so actually perhaps they are ahead of us is this is this enough for you yeah yeah uh, certainly a lot more uh, food for thought and uh, I, I feel like also if there is a more uh, scope for initiatives at, at local levels or, or um, I think you mentioned uh, fiduciary duty but uh, also subsidiary principle yeah then maybe there is a way out of this that you yeah know, if I feel empowered to do things that are within my competence then I would also maybe delegate with with trust and with solidarity yeah. to relevant people at for different skills you know so it's local, it's context sensitive, and also, and I refer to uh, uh, talk uh, we had uh, with Andrew Chen about interact interaction. It's about interaction. So it's it's about continuous dialogue, um, and then looking where trustworthiness can come into existence. Helga. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for this flashlight shining. This flashlight. Uh, through a legal um, view 
on so many problems that we are facing. Thank you. And I particularly appreciated the way how you, in my interpretation, were showing that um, the rule of law comes with increasing social complexity. Yeah. And therefore, we cannot avoid the rule of law. So the traditional societies that you show, it's a certain size, it's a certain level of complexity, but once we go beyond. And what I like very much is that you pointed the finger towards this discretionary spaces. And no law can capture everything. This is why we have interpretation and more interpretation and new laws. And it goes on developing its own kind of law. And I would just, um, you know, say um, we need to go beyond corruption. Yeah. Corruption is one part of yeah. the problem we face. Yeah. But then we get entangled uh, <clears throat> into this, um, you know, regulating ever more. And then we have all this compliance, and we have compliance of compliance. Yeah, yeah exactly. Cycles. Control and systems. Yeah. What we should look at, and this is a book I recently came across by Katharina Pistor, and the title is Code of Law. And she shows how the law has been intentionally, deliberately, systematically used for expanding the financial services around the world. And I think this is where we need to start because clearly some things are getting out of control of every everyone and everything and doing a lot of damage. So I would say, you know, corruption is one part of it but I think, uh, you know, developments have moved on. And when I read this book, I thought, well, you know, there is something that needs to be done. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, I was at some point <laughs> working at the environmental service in Rotterdam and uh, um, responsible for external safety. And we try to, and that's a very highly industrialized area of the Netherlands. And we had a lot of uh, large industries and we had uh, um, um, licenses to operate for them. And those licenses would, in the case of the Shell company, for instance, take about 250 pages, which is a lot of sort of external rules that you put on such a company. And then we had the ambition to make a license based on one page. Mm -hmm. First, we used the to micro, micro, we put 250 pages in one A4 page, and that was a sort of a joke. But eventually we, we made one which was based on their own environmental care system. So rather than sort of trying to micromanage a company that knows very well what it's doing, we transformed it to, into a system where we were based on their own system, using their own system, and then uh, uh, putting some uh, conditions to it. It had mm -hmm. to be certified, they had to report, it had to be transparent, so every year they had to report on it. And there were a few emission, like, emission uh, demands that we had. And if they would not comply, we would hit hard back uh, with a large, the, all the effort. And it saved them a lot of work, it saved us a lot of work. So sometimes that is, you can make use of, you can make hybrid systems in this, in this, in this situation. Yeah. So it's something that, 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 that came to, to, to my mind. One little experience from uh, sort of <laughs> the, the truth on the ground on, on, in, in the countries that I had worked in, in Africa, is that if, if there is a thief, he's killed. Yeah. yeah. So that's part of the, so the hitting hard back of society. Mm -hmm. And that is not, done by, that's locally done. Yeah. So yeah. that is also part of that system. Yeah, there is a, is a, a very effective checks and balances system. Yeah. Thank you very much. Harris. Uh, thank you for that nice legal interpretation of a very complex system. Um, I have two very practical questions. Uh, for a while, I used to work in the irrigation department in Egypt when I was looking at whether there was enough water to do some aquaculture. Um, 
And we were told at one time that um, nobody was corrupt in, in this very large institution. Um, but that the last two years of the tenure of the boss of the irrigation department and his two deputies, they would receive certain monies. And the reason was very simple. They didn't have a pension, or at least the pension was so small that they couldn't yep. live on it. Mm -hmm. Something similar happened in the fisheries department in Jakarta at one point, and I was talking about the 70s, uh, where all the contracts uh, that were handed out by the department um, had representatives, and these representatives would on Saturday morning drop certain envelopes on the desk of a certain officer who had then the task of distributing this money to everybody in the department because the income of these guys was basically too low. So economic factors do play a, a substantial role in our interpretation of corruption. Yeah. Um, the, the last thing is that uh, in certain circumstances, external contractors uh, actually uh, work together knowing that there is corruption at the highest level in a certain public or organization. In, in basically um, uh, agreeing among themselves what level of bribe or what type of bribe they would give to in order for a certain group of operators to actually operate in that country. So then is the question, who is corrupt? Yeah, exactly. So it, it, I think it's a far more difficult question than that we from a Western perspective say, oh, you should never do this. The, 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 the mechanisms are different. And, and I know I've experienced this myself too. If you, you're uh, uh, kept, kept to stop by, uh, by a policeman and, and you know they don't have any, you don't have, they don't have, this is the way they earn their money. Yeah, what do you do? You can't, you can't, you can't drive further. Do you, what, would, what do you do? So there are situations yeah, you'll have to cooperate sometimes and and you always have to look at the context and always have to look at how the checks and balances work and and if people have to maintain a family um yeah i, I find it very hard i'm very very uh, careful and very reluctant to judge things i think you have to keep out of of a moral judgment and be, be really really looking at what is going on, what motivations people have, what are the intentions. Perhaps the intention is to improve a situation of a group who is um, uh, disadvantaged or, um, or have the, the, there's, there's always all kinds of things going on you don't know. There are so many things you don't know and you have to know the lo local situation. Um, and it's too easy to just say, uh, look at it from a Western imperialist point of view and say, oh, no, no, it, sh it shouldn't be done. Yeah, of course, in theory, you should, perhaps a lot of things you shouldn't do, but be very, uh, be very careful with judgment and really look into what is actually going on. Is it helpful? I don't know. <laughs> so it's not a real answer, but. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sean? Sure. Thanks very much. I think it was one of the best instrumental discussions of the nature of this particular challenge that I've heard. But I want to thank you. I, I, I mean that sincerely. I, I, I want to throw three challenges at us artists. Firstly, Western approaches to this issue are the product of everything from the Code of Hammurabi to the Athenian Agora or 50 BCE through the Institutes of Gaius and Justinian, through Magna Carta, the Age of Reason, the Enlightenment, et cetera. I know that's, that, that's what we've got. Yeah. None of these societies had that. Yeah. So their cultural journey was radically different. I'm not even getting into the highly literate Asian cultures in this regard. You were speaking from the perspective of Sub-Saharan Africa. So it is nonsensical, it is irrational, it is completely nuts <laughs> to imagine that the systems that developed in one particular cultural context 
in a specific history over an extended period of time, extending from Augsburg and Westphalia, where, frankly, it had nothing to do with the rights of man. It was purely aeus regio, aeus religio. Yeah, it was yeah, simply yeah, yeah, exactly. the right of the prince to, in fact, determine what religion his people were going to have. Yeah. Then we get eventually, after we've sorted yeah. out the religious wars, we then get into the Enlightenment and we get Rousseau and Montesquieu and everyone else and Hume and Locke. And we start developing a concept of a social contract, an obligation between state and citizen. And then out of that comes the rights of man and the sovereignty of the people. And out of that then comes the rule of law. So this is a very specific tradition. And unfortunately, what we did in the 19th century, particularly after the Congress of Berlin, was we decided that we wanted access because we now had machines. We wanted access to more minerals. We wanted access to more grain. And as a consequence, we rationalized religion through the use of military force to divide up Africa and to take India and do all sorts of other interesting it's things. It was exploited. It was nothing else. Yeah. And therefore, we exported yeah. our rules yeah. to suit us yeah. in order to be able to extract value out of the environments in which we were operating. It was utterly instrumental. We instrumentalized our own laws. Of course, we fundamentally. Yeah. Yeah. Then, from the end of the Second World War onwards, we couldn't maintain these territories anymore. So from 1957 onwards, Gold Coast becomes Ghana. And everything happens after that. And now we've got to make them responsible members of a state system. Can we give them our wigs and our constitutions and everything else? <laughs> Nothing to do with history or tradition or culture or anything else. Interestingly, the French were rather better at it mm. because the French had made the leaders French first. They were in the French academies, with Bounier a little bit to the north of where you were, had been a minister in France before he became president of Côte d'Ivoire. Yeah. Uh, when uh, Senghor died, the, the uh, I'm not going to do it in French now, but the, the, the bibliography spoke of French, Black, and African. Those were the three words used on the cover of his obituary. So those concepts with Foucault, Toutois, with every single head of state across the whole of the Francophonie, that was how France managed these things. You came in after Bongo was no longer there. Ah, Bongo was still there. Yeah, I know, but yeah. what I mean yeah. is in, in the position that he'd been in previously. Yeah. yeah. During the early days, a French member of the Secret Service controlled his presidential guard. Yeah, exactly, water. exactly. And well, the French were so dominant, it's going to go and you'd yep. never have been there with Shell because El Fakitain had all of the contracts yep. until after Foucault died. Yeah. So you know, we, we've got to be realistic about what yep. we're looking at. And, yep. and, and you've disclosed, I think, extremely well the nature of the underlying challenges. You can't be an uncontested African in an environment where nothing that organizes your life is is related to your experience of your culture. Exactly. It's, a, it's yeah. an entirely imposed reality. Yeah. And the corrupt cause are actually the financial services institutions and the major exploiting companies, mm -hmm. oil companies, mining companies, industrial companies, who pay the bribes. Yeah. The other people are just the receivers. They are the corruptees, not the corrupt cause. Very true. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Can much. One more question. Uh, well, one quick question. Slightly into the living after such a good uh, question and explanation. Um, I was wondering, I, I see how these Western systems impose on these uh, state of Saharan African systems because it does not work and does not pro uh, provide like any well being outcome for the people. The question is, how can we then start to develop these alternative systems based on their local values and be able to scale them up and be competitive? The one thing I recognize about Western values, you can talk about how we've been extremely destructive, which is true, and how we like dominate and control like a large part of the world's economy. But you are extremely competitive as nation states. And the question is, how exactly. can you long yeah. scale up? And yeah. because to actually, like, to actually develop its own system, it will have to compete against these Western value systems, protect trade, protect these, its shores, against foreign fishing fleets, stuff like that. 
Oh, yeah. The cynical answer is that we, we are too much attached to, to our economy, to, uh, to goods, to, uh, to the external things. What I found as an enormous uh, source of, of wisdom is, is what we um, encountered uh, with, in, with local people in the jungle. They were an alphabet, they, they lived very close to nature, but they were so impressive. They had such strong personalities and such increased, increased wisdom. And not talking no, noble savages kind of stuff. I really talk about living a life in, in a natural and a um, well-functioning, stable ecosystem, which is not about stuff. It's about life itself. And we kind of outsourced our life to goods, to wealth, to, to be, we are thinking in the future of what we would like to have and, and how we can secure our interests. So it's fear-based, it's greed-based. And as long <laughs> as we are trapped in that loop, we will not be open to a different outlook on society, namely enjoying life itself in the very here and now. And if it's one thing we could learn from indigenous cultures, it's that. So it's a completely different orientation on life. And I think I can't predict the future, nobody can, but there is quite there's, it's quite likely that some ecological disasters may happen. And perhaps that's the shock we need to, to return to what life in the end all about mm -hmm. and perhaps that changes also how we organize ourselves how we uh, look at the world uh, how we look at each other at ourselves and i think that's desperately needed i don't say we need disasters but <clears throat> i think we need a different way of well perhaps uh, referring to terry sinovsky this morning how we mirror ourselves if we look at the mirror who would we like to be what is life about it's about, if you look at, at uh, indigenous cultures, it's about the quality of relationship, actually. It's, it's, it's not about things. We are too matter attached, or perhaps I shouldn't say that, but we are, it's commodification. We are, we are completely caught up in verdienlichung, externalization. And that's our Western economy. Thank you. Thank you.